Hey, this is Dennis, and welcome to another episode of the Ground of Reason podcast, where tech and policy collide. I like that dramatic pause there. That's my collision noise. Oh. That was your... Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Today, we're going to be uh, discussing rural America and um, their access to broadband and and really kind of how we've gotten into the situation where there are these huge divides on um, who gets internet access and who doesn't in this country. And we're going to probably, you know, wrap that all up in a nice little bow by the end and tie it all back to what's happening right now with Title II and the FCC. At least that's my plan. <laughs> Let's see how we do. <laughs> So, um, it all started, um, like the idea for this show started, um, last week when I read, uh, an article in 538, yep. um, by, uh, Nate Silver. Uh, if you don't know Nate Silver, he like, uh, he, he was kind of like the wizard. Um, I remember like a few years back, um, yeah, when in the 2012 yeah, election, he used like this thing called math to yep. figure out like, polls. I've heard of that. And everyone was really amazed. So there was this thing called math. I always thought it was funny how like Nate Silver was just like this dubbed like kind of like this wizard. Like he's mag he's magic. Yeah, I was like he's just. It's really... very Monty Python. I know. Who are, who are you who's so right. wise in the ways of science? And I'm like sitting there like I took college statistics. That's really. Yeah. I mean, he's uh, really using kind of just like remedial I mean, he's college a, statistics. He's a bright guy. Oh, it's brilliant, brilliant guy. But I mean, like it's just. You know, but his real brilliance is that he recognized that people weren't really doing this. <laughs> That's the part that gets me is he really just kind of took like the first two statistics classes you take and like ran with it. And yeah, and looked around and said, hey, <laughs> here's a whole sector where people are just not doing this. Really, anyone outside of any type of like engineering they just don't use math. I, I find it even in, in like com it's unbelievable because I've pulled an eight silver or two myself at work where mm -hmm. I'll like break open Excel and like throw a couple of formulas together and, and people are like, oh, wow, that's how you get burned as a witch, right? <laughs> like you need to be careful, man. <laughs> So, so, so Nate Silver uh, started 538, and now, uh, like, they, they started kind of like politics, and now it's just kind of run the gamut where they kind of, they'll do... They talk about a lot of policy. There's that. They even do, things. like, they do sports. They're kind of yep. even... They, they, oh, I think he's a big sports buff. Right. So, but the, the, an article that caught my eye um, had to do with a county in Colorado called uh, Sawatch. So, oh, sorry, sorry, Sawatch. It's Is spelled, that how you pronounce it? Yeah, S-A-G-U-A-C-H-E. I think it's pronounced Sawatch. All right. So if you're in Colorado, correct us if you know. I think I got it. If I do, if I, I think I think that's right. Yeah, well, we're going with it. Um, but basically, it's like a four-hour drive southwest of Colorado, of uh, Denver, Colorado. And um, researchers at um, Iowa, um, Iowa and Arizona State University um, looked at a bunch of counties in the United States and basically figured out that Sawatch County w was at the bottom of internet access when it, uh, in America, like in yeah. American counties. It and really it came down to broadband access. Right. And it basically only 5.6% of adults were estimated to have broadband access. So just for clarification, broadband access in this definition is 15 MIPS? 25, I think. 25. 25. Okay. See, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that study used that standard because that's like a more recent FCC standard came out about two years ago, three years right. ago. Um, but I did see in the article that they said um, that if a household wants a download speed of 12 megabits per second and an upload of two megabits per second, they can expect to pay about $90 a month. Man, that's steep. That is terrible. Like, I don't pay $90. Like, $90 a month, a gigabit in, like, around Baltimore City yeah. costs $70 a month. Yep. Like, 80 if you count the modem rental. 
Which is really, really fast. Yeah. From a technical perspective. Like, <laughs> that's just, exactly what it is. That's the technical that's term. That's the technical term. Really, really fast. It's very fast. It's, I would say it's a jiffy. It's in a jiffy. It's jiffy, in a jiffy. A jiffy is actually a technical term. No, it is. It's a scientific measure of time. No, it's oh, like the Google. Distance, time right? distance. <laughs> so, Google is a mathematical term. Um, so um, just so you know, though, this county, I wanted to kind of go over kind of like, which they didn't do in the article. I went and kind of went and looked up the demographic of the the county um and this is a lot of this is according to the 2000 census there are about six thousand people living there with you know 23 um there were 2300 households um the population density was two people per square mile yeah they did reference this part in the article oh okay they they said it was about 6300 you know i think in like 2016 or something like okay and you know obviously the the square miles didn't change so it was still about that i mean like which is really sparsely populated for everywhere else in the united states yeah well what they didn't mention was the racial makeup which i kind of want to cover just to give people an idea um it's 71 percent white uh point one two percent so a tenth of a percent really uh african-american two percent native american half a percent Asian and 23% other races, which I can only assume that Latino or Hispanic take up a big chunk of that because yeah. they didn't really mention it in the demographic information. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give people a feel uh, for like the type, the, of, the type of county we're talking, talking about here. Um, and um, there are, let's see, of those like 23,000, I mean, sorry, 2,300 households, uh, about a third of them have, you know, children under the age of 18 living at home. So, I mean, a pretty typical, well, I mean, like with the, like, it's a pretty typical, like family, um, makeup. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a three, you know, th- about three to four people per household, roughly. Yeah, I would say the age demographics sounds pretty average in terms of there being, a fair number of um, people that have children at home, children in the community, and then elderly people. Right. I mean, whereas the, the racial demographics skews are white. white skewed. Yeah, it's yeah. Very, it skews white. Um, the median household income of the county is thirty three, and this is twenty fifteen numbers. Is uh thirty three thousand three hundred ninety three dollars. So that's pretty low. Pretty low, considering the median household I think income. It's like fifty four nationwide. It's roughly like mid fifties. In Colorado, though, it's sixty three thousand nine hundred and nine dollars. Yeah, and Colorado has a lot of high income jobs, both from the tech sector, but you've also got a lot of government work from uh, you know NORADs out there. So you got a lot of Air Force jobs and so on. Um, so their overall, um, income, you know, median is higher than the rest of the nation, but I, I mean, 33 is really low. Oh, it's super low. And uh, like, this is, and, and kind of like why we're bringing this up is cause there's like an obvious correlation, uh, now I'm not saying it's called, I mean, personally, I feel that. Uh, if you had decent broadband access in an area, some people would start picking themselves up because there's opportunity. Well, and so this there. is one of the things when you brought this up as a topic, I I started doing a little research. And um, do you remember the name of that government agency underneath the Commerce Department? Um, yes, it's the the, um, uh, the TIC. Yeah, the right? National Telecommunications and Internet Administration. Yeah, so I I did a little research on their site, and we can link this out. Um, But in 2016, they did uh, some research on the digital divide, which is, you know, just a colloquial for, like, um, basically the difference between the population that has access to the Internet versus those that do not. And... um, one of the things they pointed out in this study was that 
you can see very clearly in the data that um, income and education level, rather than just rural versus urban, uh, makes up like the big divide between who has internet access and who doesn't. Right. And so what I mean by that is if you look at affluent families in rural communities and affluent families in urban communities, they're almost in lockstep. Yeah. They're off the, by like a percent, I think it was, Yeah, and, and from each other. Yeah, and we were talking about this, and it, it probably has more to do with, well, yes, it's expensive. But they get, can afford it. Right. They can afford it, so they get it. Um, cause it's going to be more expensive to deliver that service to rural America than it is to deliver it to an urban area. Yeah. And we've talked about that in the, in the past, right? Like that there's, you know, if you're in these, uh, rural communities, it, it's, you know, just because of population density, like the economics are such that it really is very expensive to get internet connectivity out to those people, which is why, you know, it kind of screams for some sort of, you know, government intervention, much like we did with uh, electricity right. in the 30s. Yeah. And that was, I mean, when you look at the money for the time that was spent to, uh, like, you know, provide electricity to rural America, to do the same with broadband is almost kind of like a drop in the bucket. Oh, yeah. It would be uh, significantly cheaper. Like, Just give you an example. Like, my mother grew up in West Virginia without electricity until she was 14. Like, so this is in, like, the 50s, right? Like, um, so imagine that. In in the 50s, not having electricity and then in the – not having indoor plumbing until, you know, she was, like, 18. So it's just a lot of very rural communities – struggle with these things. So when the the federal government started doing large cash outlays to like, you know, push uh, electricity throughout the country, it made a huge difference, uh, particularly in Appalachia, but in a lot of different other places. Right. And and like, you know, Sawatch isn't like the only you know, it's not alone out there. According no. to like federal the the um an FCC study, 39% of rural Americans which is like 23%, I mean, so I'm sorry, 23 million people, but this is like 39% of people who live in a rural designated area. Um, they have no access to broadband. Yeah. I mean, 23 million people, that's a huge number, right? I mean, obviously, we all know that's a big number, but I mean, even out of the country, right? Like, if you just think in proportion, that's like eight and a half, nine percent 9% of our pot no. Seven and a half, eight percent of our country, yeah, roughly, right, has you know no access to the internet in these rural communities, right? And you, I mean, if you listen to the podcast, you know how I feel about this, but I, I feel that um, internet is it's it's getting up there with electricity because in today's right. society it's not it's no longer a luxury well in in we were talking about this earlier when we were off mic this idea that what scares me about this so think of it as again when you look at the uh the uh commerce department's report you can see that the people that are uh not using the internet predominantly are um, of lower income. They have less education Yep, and they're older. Yes. Those are all vulnerable segments of our society Mm -hmm. and they are all segments of our society where we have put in place government programs to assist them in various ways. Right. And like, you know, um, Social Security, you can Wake. file for that online now. Yeah, I mean, there's um, all sorts of stuff. You know, you can uh, file for, you know, if you're, you can, uh, uh, I think WIC, you yeah. can, uh, like all of those programs you can file for online. Yeah, and so so you think about those where there are these big government services that, that help people stabilize their lives so they mm-hmm. can 
you know, advance themselves and so on, or, or just, you know, survive in many cases. And like, uh, the scary thing is those over the last 10 years or so, because budgets are tighter and so on since the great recession, um, what's been happening with government services is that they've been moving more and more online because they're just more cost effective. Right. Right. So as they move online, that means the, at least a good chunk of the people that really need these services don't really have a lot of access to these services. No, not the, none. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that gets me is, and then you're doing things like, um, like some services are, they're not going completely online, but in order to receive those services uh, in part, like you'd ha- you'd have to drive hours in some locations, in some locations to yeah. go to go get those services. Um, and then uh, even if, but it, that's just like on the government side. If you look at what's happening in the private sector, you can't hand in a paper. Like, where do you send a paper job application these days? Yeah. Or it's, you know, it's going to be only you don't. In- it's all online. Well, in, in in the few jobs where you would do that, where you would fill out a paper job application, are jobs that people don't really want, right? Like, they're, they're jobs that, and I don't mean to cast dispersions, like, work's work, right? Like, right. we all got to do what we got to do, but they're in jobs that people largely look at as... A paycheck. You know, yeah, yeah. They're just grinding out a living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And so... It gives little to no upward mobility for, you know, anyone who doesn't have access to these other services. And that's where the term, you know, digital divide really comes into play is this idea of there are those of us that are uh, participating in, you know, whatever you want to call it, the digital economy, whatever, right? And those that are not. And... You know, part of that's adoption, right? Like older generations just not not taking it up and so on. But part of it's access, right? Like it's really expensive, right? And and in some cases, just straight up not available to get internet access at all, let alone decent internet access, which is what Dennis is really talking about with the broadband. Right. So um, also like in the article, it talks about how... Um, there is like a hunger for internet access to the point where um, there's a quote from someone they're speaking to that said, uh, you know, they had people sitting out in a park at like 10 p.m. at night. Yep. And, you know, they're wondering, like, what are they going on? There's like, they don't see them drinking or like right. smoking or, you know, doing anything kind of like illegal. Um, but they saw like lights up. And it was because there was a new business that opened up, and they didn't secure. They actually went and you know sprung the for the money to get like a high speed connection, and they didn't secure their router. So mm-hmm. people were hanging out in the park, um, just like doing pirating this thing. their uh, exactly. Uh, but it was yeah. like a bunch of people in. A, okay, it, it, you're in a park in a small like rural area, and there's like you know people coming together in the park. It, it, a population. I mean, if if the whole entire county is like six thousand people, you know, ten people together in a park is probably like yeah, it raises a, eyebrows. A massive amount of people. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, they they figured out that you know they were you know they informed the business eventually. Hey, you know, secure your Wi Fi. But that like started to get people thinking of you know we need some type of you know, min- municipal services and they've talked to a lot of like the big carriers and they really can't entice any of them to come to the county um right. because it's just not um it's cro- it's cost prohibitive according to those companies to do so right and there's also like a mention in there um when it comes to you know, the, the benefit, like uh, there's a quote from some, and then this, this person supports, um, she's like Shirley Bloomfield. She's the CEO of rural broadband access. And, um, she mentioned a 2016 study, uh, that said that 66% of the economic impact of a rural broadband initiative actually goes to urban economies. Right. 
because that's where all of the um, you know equipment and resources usually come mm-hmm. from to put that broadband out there. So for a rural community to in, invest in broadband, right off the bat, they're going to be losing 66% of that initial startup money. It's not going to go back into their local economy. It's going to sure. go somewhere else. Yeah, because they don't have the expertise or equipment right. to put it in place. So, I mean, it, it's difficult um, for these kind of, you know, communities to get that going, which kind of goes into um, what it, it really kind of dovetails into what we want to talk about today. And it's like, how did it get this way? Right. Like, why is it that there are so few providers out there? Like, of course, in rural, you know, rural America, um, you know, it, it might be cost prohibitive, but even in a big city, um, there's big cities that are only served by one provider. Yeah, we've talked about it here. Uh, we have two, right? And that's, I mean, fairly unusual, right? Like that we have two major providers that right. that compete against each other, Verizon and Comcast. Yeah, and it really gets back to, um, like, there's... It, the way we have internet today, it's delivered really, I mean, yes, there's satellite internet, but for the most part, there are two industries that kind of put internet out there. And that's, you know, cable and telecom. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is um, the telecom industry had its own like regulatory system in place, which, um, you know, kind of when internet came out, that was kind of bastardized to regulate internet for them. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had cable television, which had its own like regulations around it that right. were kind of bastardized for them when they started to come out with internet broadband. So yep. you kind of had like, you never really had um, an internet policy. It was kind of like this evolution of telecom rules and evolution of the 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 rules that governed um cable television which really are more local state level rules because that wasn't really governed at a federal level um and if you if you dissect the history here and we'll go back you know AT&T is really where it all started yeah, for that, telecom that's the obvious because um Alexander Graham Bell you know, invented the telephone. Yeah, we're going that far back. Well, I mean, and uh, that became AT&T. Sure. And over time, um, AT&T became what is called a natural monopoly, or what we look at as a natural monopoly. And the government essentially said that it's okay for... Actually, AT&T convinced the government is really what happened is, you know, it'll be better for all if there is no competition mm. and we're just allowed to provide telephone service to the country. So it was really just a national telephone service. And that's what we call in like policy circles, industry uh, capture where like the regulatory agencies uh, become so influential inside or the, when the industry becomes so influential inside the regulatory agencies that they just start to parrot what the industry wants. Right. And so after a while, I mean it was it got it got pretty crazy. I mean some of you remember. Um yeah, there was a point in time where all the telephone equipment was provided by AT&T. Yeah. Even if you were a competitor utilizing AT&T's lines like because they, they would, absolutely yeah they would they would like if a competitor would have to still use AT&T services and AT&T since they had that monopoly had to force you to use like they forced you to use their yeah. phones there was a long time where the, like you know it's not a good joke but the running joke was like you can have any color uh phone you want this is when people cared about the color of their phone you know, because they were hanging on the wall or sitting on a desk. Right. Right. Uh, right there in the open of your house. Uh, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> right. Because that's all AT&T made. Right. So after a while, um, there were, you know, there actually there were quite a few lawsuits brought up against AT&T. Yeah. Because, I mean, while they did have, they were, 
while they did have the government uh, declare them a, a monopoly and said that they had to have all their acquisitions approved, it was at the point where a local local telephone for local telephone service to go into a place they needed AT and T. So AT and T sure. could use that leverage, and basically they created what was called at the time the Bell system, to yeah. where you had like these regional uh, you know telephone exchanges that were really essentially owned by yeah they were subsidiaries AT&T. Um, so in 18, in 1984 um, uh, uh, people started to like kind of get wise to the uh, to the the fact that it's it's not good to have one company dictate all the hardware that's going to be used on this infrastructure yeah. especially in an age where technology was taking off and i mean if you've mentioned it before how long did the fax machine just kind of like sit uh, i think it was invented in the mid to early 70s and it just was parked and this is one of the things that irks me we'll get to it i'm sure but about the current chairman of the fcc's like uh you know innovation argument about letting the market do what it needs to and leaving the monopolist alone is that, you know, when we saw that happen in recent history with, you know, AT&T, they invented tons of brilliant stuff. Yeah, Bell, Bell Labs, Labs is responsible for tons of good Yeah, but invention. they parked a lot of it yep. because they found it inconvenient for whatever reason. So in, in 1984, uh, you know, they broke up. Yeah. They busted up the bells and, and got Verizon, et cetera. Well, yeah. Well, they bo- they basically like the, the big companies. Um, they, they were broken into Ameritech, Bell South. Um, you know, I mean, CMP Telephone uh, yeah. was one. Uh, Pacific Tel uh, Pacific uh, Telesis, Southwestern Bell, which actually eventually went back to a became AT and T, Bell Atlantic. Uh, 9x and us west and those are the major ones there's others there's like were some smaller bells but those were kind of like the bigger of the yeah. baby bells um ameritech bell south pacific telesis and southwestern bell all kind of like formed into the, like you know they are uh they got their they were the lions that got voltron back together yeah. and formed at&t again um bell atlantic 9x eventually it became a Verizon. Yeah. Um, and then US West um became um eventually became CenturyLink, which bought Quest and is now a major internet provider. Right. Um and then there's some other things that happened too. Like there were companies like MCI, it was a company yeah. that offered long distance services, GTE uh, Lytel, they all were bought by Verizon. So uh, essentially, all of AT and T, they broke it apart, and it eventually kind of like formed into AT and T, Verizon, and um, CenturyLink. Yep, is really kind of the story there. So we have a monopoly, and the government backed yeah. monopoly. And it got busted up. But still, like they were able to build out an infrastructure under protection. Yep. Um, and then you have the you know three major players today that are still kind of profiting from that situation. Hmm. Uh, so what's happening on the cable side? Because there's this whole other component here. And how did that happen? And it's kind of a similar story, except it's not national; it's local. Right. Because. When cable TV kind of really started getting to, and and the real issue here comes to, um, it costs a ton of money to lay this type of infrastructure. Uh, And that's kind of how AT&T convinced the government that it would make sense to just allow them to kind of be declared a natural monopoly and to just build it out. Because um you're it's really difficult to have competition in in a situation like that because it's so expensive to put that infrastructure up to have another company decide to overbuild to where they're going to duplicate that infrastructure or well, is quite a risk yeah and and what's funny is AT&T basically made the argument the railroads made for you know decades and then the government came along and made the argument they used to bust up the railroads to bust up AT&T. Right. Right. So it's, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme, right? Like, 
So uh, what ended up happening with the cable industry? So, okay, you had... When when cable TV kind of started, they needed to build out these um, television networks. These are the, basically the capacity to carry TV. In doing so, to do that was expensive. And uh, for a company to kind of throw out that type of capital, they would need some kind of guarantee. So what would happen is uh, localities mm-hmm. would basically say, all right, we'll give you an exclusive franchise deal to our locality here, and then you will, you know, and, and some were subsidized and got yeah. kickbacks, and, 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 and we'll build it out, and then we'll allow you to supply, you know, the t- the cable TV for X amount of years, great. And and the beginning it was it kind of was it was fine yeah. because you you literally it's a had typical arrangement. You had like forty to fifty companies kind of prop up yeah. into like these local areas, um, like you had Adelphia, um, Philadelphia Cable Vision, Prime Communications, uh, Medine Hunter, Comcast, EW Scripts. Jones Intercable, Landfest Communications, Susquehanna Communications, Patriot Media. Those were all local cable companies um, in and around um, the, you know, East Coast back then. Right. They all became Comcast, the one I mentioned there, bought all of those up over time. Yeah. And, um, you know, and became one conglomerate. Um, Time Warner bought, like, one, two, three, let's say like seven companies over the time, seven local exchanges. And they were eventually bought by Charter, who on their own right had about 10 local regional companies that they bought up. Right. Um, in the end, it wound up on the cable side of the house, all we have left really that matter, uh, Comcast, Charter, and Cox. You have a few little, I think, uh, I think Mediacom and... um there's cable one cable cable one is in the top 10 cable providers or actually i think they're in the top 10 internet providers and they have like 300,000 subscribers yeah. like e- e- this really comes down to a similar scale of like when you when you go look at like military powers there's a really big drop off after you get past 3 right Right, so, like once you're after after the top three, it's a really really steep drop off. Right, so we had it's very it's very similar to how things worked on the telecom side, but instead of having like one starting focal point that was broken up and then brought back together, it started as kind of like a regional system. Yep. Um, and they were you know it, you, it consolidated. Uh, right, because one of those regional companies gets big, they're doing really well. They're making mm-hmm. money for whatever reason. And they're like, well, you know, next door, there's this other company. Why don't we merge? Because yep. then we'll both be able to share in the profits here. Or they get gobbled up in right. an acquisition. Exactly. And that, that's, that is just kind of like the natural evolution of things. And you'll see like Time Warner Cable was huge. And then they got gobbled up by a charter. Um, Cox Communication is out there. Yep. They're the small player right now. Um, there's talk of them being purchased. Yeah. Um, so really, I think this is going to end. I mean, unless you know the, a regulatory body, body has something to say about it, it's going to end in one cable provider. Yeah, there's there's really only two ways, well, nah, three it can end because they don't compete. Yeah. On the on the regional of level, they don't. Right. Like, he, it's not cartel behavior in the sense that there's no obvious collusion. Right. Right. But well, it just um, doesn't make sense for them to overbuild. Like, why? Why take that risk? Because it's yeah. like such a huge capital outlay. That's exactly right. To put a network in to compete with one another, that yeah. they might as well just stay to their own areas. It's kind of just like they really just. It was like the you know the two or three like the two or three best player like the best players in your gym class got together and picked teams, and that's kind of yeah. how. That's exactly how what it you, wound what up. What you do is you sit, you sit there, you sock away money. Based off of your margin, your high margin areas where you've already sunk in the capital to where you can, you know, actually rake in a margin. Right. And you wait and you wait until 
you can buy the competition on some sort of discount because they run into hard times right. or whatever. Usually, so ec- you're, uh, uh, economic swings usually it's, tilt. Yeah, they, it's they, a, they, they, it's a catalyst for this sort of behavior. Yeah, it's a poker hand, right? right? It's like playing Texas Hold'em, right? right? You have a strong hand. The other person has a weaker hand. You bet small for a long time. Just wait for them to make a right. big mistake. Or wait for the market to crash and right. you're sitting on lots of cash. Wait until your hand gets really good or theirs gets really bad. Exactly. And th- and that's, so it's it's kind of, while it is a different tale, it's kind of the same tale on both yeah, ends. Same of the, idea. Same right? idea of, of, of between telecom and cable. And those are the companies that really control access to the internet right now for consumers. Yep. And those are the companies that we're kind of dependent upon to kind of provide internet access to these rural counties that don't yeah. have it. Now, I know a lot of people out there are like, well, what about wireless? And yes, that's a possibility too, but when it comes to... You know, our 4G network isn't really that robust. No, and actually, if you uh, refer to that Pew study I sent you, yeah, I think it was something like 13 or 15 percent of like younger internet entrants, like so people that are younger that are first really getting their connection to the internet, Mm -hmm. they're starting to go more wireless, but like. All existing, you know, uh, people that have not yet started to use the internet. So the 20 million people that Dennis was referring to earlier, those people aren't trending that direction, right? Right. Like they're either uh, looking for the traditional methods of accessing the internet via broadband or... um, you know, they're, or I'm sorry, telecom or cable, or they're just not getting it right now. Right. Yeah, because like, I was looking at a recent study of um, mobile internet, and the U.S. isn't even in the top 25. No. And it is encouraging, I think, to see that a decent chunk, like I said, it was, I think, about 15%. Of, you know, the the young people coming up that are from these communities that don't don't have a lot of readily available Internet access are doing what you see normally like in the developing world. Right. Where they're just leapfrogging and going right to wireless. Right. But but still, the the, the average speed is like pretty low. Well, yeah, out there, especially. I mean, if you. It's the average speed across the board uh, for internet connectivity in wireless in this country is 10.7 MIPS. Yeah, I mean, my wireless connection here in Grounded Central uh, or in Grounded Reason Central is not so great, right? Like, because we're, <laughs> we're in our little office, right? Like, so imagine, you know, you're in rural Colorado, you know, right. around all of those mountains. And you're, it's, it's your only lifeline. I mean, mobile, I mean, my wireless connection is kind of like my, my backup. Like if yeah. I, if I can't get to like a wireline, you know, so, um, so it's, while 5G is on the way, our current wireless infrastructure isn't really, you know, robust enough to deliver it to these rural communities no, not in any really. type of mass scale to where it's going to kind of alleviate the issues that we're having well and don't forget when we start talking about like mobile devices typically we're talking about smartphones right right? and so you've got a form factor problem there remember most of the people we're talking about uh skew older right that that are on the i'll for simplicity i'll say the wrong side of the digital divide right right so you just Everything on a mobile device is scaled down, right? So it's harder for them to read. It's harder for them to use. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a touch screen. So if they've ever had um, any exposure to a computer, whatever they learned at that time is out the window, right? Like, so it just makes everything a little bit more difficult 
And and you just got to think adoption is going to be lower for a demographic like that. Right. So this kind of gets to the point of how do we solve this problem? Because these big companies don't, they just don't see, they don't see, you know, the profit there. It's just not, it's, it, it just it, doesn't make sense for them to build out to, you know, these areas. They don't have any real vested interest in supplying to those areas because they can make more money by squeezing extra services or, you know, incrementally raising rates in existing markets. Right. Like, it just doesn't make sense. So it's going to leave, and, and we, we were kind of talking about this, where if you don't have access to the internet, and I mean, when I say Joel and I were talking about this offline, um, you kind of get stuck in a media bubble because all you have really is, you know, you might be able to get the paper, like the local yeah. paper, maybe. Um, you might have cable television to where you get to watch, you know, cable news. That's it. Yeah. But your, your, your local news. I yeah. mean, but those are, you're not getting a, you're not going to be able, you're not going to have access. You're cut off from kind of like what urbanized areas are discussing. Well, even suburban, right? Or like, yeah, suburban areas. Because again, like in the studies we were looking at, like the suburban communities are right on par with the urban communities, right? Like they're eh, a tiny bit. It's really less, it's, there's no it's, difference between. It's basically no difference. No. I mean, right. I mean, there are there are differences, but, but there's when a it comes few to percentages. I mean, like uh, other differences, but when it comes to like you know the digital divide, it's really non-existent. Yeah, exactly. So, so one of the things I was saying to Dennis is. Just imagine, like, uh, the very heated political discourse that we all have been talking about in various, you know, different modes. We've talked about it on this podcast, and, you know, certainly it's all over the place on social media, et cetera. Like, these people, I mean, not only are, are not able to participate in that, they're not even seeing it. No. Right? Like, they're just not, right? Like, because they don't have internet access. Right, like so, let alone a Facebook account or a you know Twitter feed, right? Like they just don't they don't have internet access, period. So like, you know the 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 spam emails that we all get from people of one political leaning or the other that we gripe about and we debate about and we argue over and fake news this and fake news whatever, like n a lot of that is just not reaching these folks. Right. And so their portion of the, uh, you know, media they're consuming is just whatever they can scrape out of cable news. Right. That's it. And um, actually, in the article, uh, the 538 article, that was kind of brought about. It was like, because they said the more that you kind of create, uh, and he used the word second class citizen. Yeah. Um, the the more you continue to see some of these political divides um i mean and this is somebody that they um you know interviewed in the article um he basically said uh, that he feels as though that this last election um those people those people cut off roared a little bit yeah i mean and that's i mean that's essentially kind of what happened well if you think about it like it's it's understandable like it, it's they're hearing, you know, one portion of the discussion and no retort, right? Mm -hmm. Like, none. So it's not like the rest of us who are just inundated with information regarding all sorts of nuanced arguments one way or the other. And, like, we can all ferret out what we think is the, the right way to think about these, you know, particular issues. But if all you hear is one political slam of whatever ilk, right? right? Like, that's how you're going to think, right? Like, it's just the nature of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, every day, if that's, you know, what you're reading and what you're seeing, then yeah. that, that's your reality. You know, what you experience is what you, you know, or what you perceive becomes your reality. Your reality. Right. Yeah. And, and the great thing about the internet is, I mean, there's a lot of great things. But one of the great things is... There's such an ab 
abundance of information. Like I, I've joked with Dennis that like the internet um, killed every barroom argument about like you know trivia. Oh, I know it, it's is. great. Like there's never right. ever or actually no, I've seen some like Neanderthals actually yeah, like well, sit down there and I'm just like. Oh, just guys, Google it here, right? Yeah, like <laughs> here's my phone. You know, oh, so and so was in the movie. No, that was Kevin Spacey. No, well, hold on. Let me no, go it was to Abe IMDb. Vigoda. Yeah, <laughs> what are you talking? Let about? me go to IMDb. <laughs> right, like boom, I know exactly who's and what. And so, like, you can't fact check. I, I still just ask my wife. Yeah, sure. So. Well, she's normally right, <laughs> but like, you can't fact check stuff. Without access to the internet, right? right. Like it's, it, I mean, it's possible. It's just really hard, and so, like, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't see a good solution to this. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're getting into, and and it, it's honest with, with with title two because what everyone has heard and what everyone is talking about with title two, I'm starting to kind of realize that it's really the issue is disguised a bit. Because when you look at telecom and you look at cable companies and you look at Ajit Pai, we've all said this before that their arguments really don't make much sense. No, because they're comp- they're they're saying that they support net neutrality. Yep. Um, but they don't support the Title II, and the way the law works is it's the only way to get one is to have the other. Right. And really, what they're scared about, and a lot of people they'll, they'll like sometimes you'll hear about um. Because when Wheeler put the Title II in place, he just did it on the no blocking and the no throttling and no fast lanes. He left out, because there are a bunch of provisions in, in Title II, because Title II is an old, it's, um you know, the legacy regulatory rules for telecommunications. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a bunch of rules around... Um, like the ability for the FCC to regulate rates and yeah. the ability, um, which I really don't think the FCC would do. I don't think it's a particularly good idea no. either. Um, but they're, the thing that they don't talk about much, because A, it's kind of wonky and complicated, but B, um, I think a lot of citizens might say, hey, maybe that's not such a bad idea, is local loop unbundling what you might say yeah <laughs> um but basically local loop unbundling is essentially saying um that infrastructure that you have that because of you know your monopoly powers is really not yours yeah it's everyone's and you have to share it with all your competitors and they've done they did they did that with the phone with the phone system. Sure. Um, uh, England or the UK rather has done that with their internet system, and it's very cheap compared to ours. Yeah, and very fast compared to ours. True. Um, a lot of us, you know, um, don't really think that's such a bad idea here to try with the internet now. Telecom doesn't want you to know that. Of course. Cable TV doesn't want you to know that because then they've kind of lost their, um, you know, edge in the market. Yeah. Because at that point, if you've kind of nationalized the infrastructure, all the innovation happens on delivery. Like you, the, la- the basically between that backbone and the customer, there's plenty of room to innovate and there's plenty of room for competition because at that point, anyone they they just are wholesalers of the you know the backbone to the internet to whoever wants to start a company if i want to start a company to deliver internet in my neighborhood i could yeah you know anyone could yeah Um, and this is the thing that blows my mind about the whole discussion is i think this is this type of thing is inevitable right like sooner or later we're going to do it and so if i were the telecom and uh cable companies What I would be doing is looking to try and prevent that, not by blocking regulation. I would be trying to spin myself off into a utility and going, hey, we're just going to provide this utility service. We'll keep a low margin 
and uh, everybody leave us alone. Right. Well, I mean, I you're a little more optimistic than I am. I just think that's a smarter play on their Oh, part. I definitely think it's the way to go. I mean, and I'm sure people have raised problems because they actually kind of did this um, with the DSL yeah. um, boom back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And a lot of people who are against local loop unbundling point to that and say, well, all those DSL companies failed. And the reason they failed was because the, well, though they did have a boom and they didn't make some profit. There was a time where, you know, your AT&Ts and your Verizons and, you know, decided, hey, why should they be making all this cash? And they started upping the their wholesaler rates. Yeah, it's or basically a, the the it's rates, a lease rate. Right, the, the lease. They basically upped the payments of the lease to where they couldn't be competitive with Verizon and AT and T. Yeah. So they they kind of muscled them out. Now, if the FC in a Title II world where you're actually using using local loop unbundling, the government can say, well, you can't compete with those companies you are only a wholesaler of the backbone if you want to compete you need to have a separate div- like company that is regulated you know separate from the internet backbone and that's piece. effectively what i'm arguing is that it would force them to be utility players right on you know just providing access to the internet for these uh you know edge players that would provide whatever services to local communities. Right. And people are like, I've also heard, well, that's not fair to take this infrastructure from these companies that have worked so hard. But if you listen to the first, you know, 50 some odd minutes of this podcast, they were under some very kind of, you know, um, they were in the catbird seat. Yeah, they've been they've been claiming um, what is called uh, monopoly rents, like in yeah. in economics they call it monopoly rents, for like a long time, a long long time, a long long and time with a lot of like government protection. And... Don't forget that the government also put a lot of money in up front and along the way, both yeah. in like you know the creation of the internet, but also the um, oftentimes, like free copper was given out. Yep, free fiber was given out to yep. these companies. I mean, and on the on the local on the like the local level, I'm all sure sorts of tax there were breaks some were sweet given. Heart deals for a lot of these cable companies. To so come my heart shop. bleeds for these companies. And we're not talking about just taking it. Like yeah. these companies, like, compensate them for it. Yeah, you would pay them fair value, right? And it gives them a way. And and really, at that point. You know, they can, you know, they can spin off, you know, a subsidiary that's completely separate and regulated separately yep. to compete and, they had and deliver to home users. Deep coffers to do right. it because of whatever compensation they got. But could you imagine if that backbone was kind of unleashed to any business that wants to just go ahead and start up, you know, an ISP? Yeah. And there's alternative you... ways you could do it, too. Right. But... You know, you, you wouldn't have to, like, straight nationalize it, which is one, you know, pretty good option. We've done that with lots of different things. Well, no, but yeah, you could still keep those companies. But you could do it like the electric grid, right. where it's not it's not nationalized. No, those companies could still yeah. kind of own and manage it. Yeah, and they draw a, you know, relatively set percentage off of the use right there's a number of ways to do it i'm not advocating one way i'm just saying that there needs to be a separation from the backbone of the internet and kind of like the consumer you know i mean and and to get really technical it's it's really your tier one uh providers that's exactly right and your tier well they say three but it's really tier two it's two yeah so i mean if you just created a situation where you could wholesale access to the internet to companies that would provide broadband access. You could have so many competitors and they can innovate because at that point you've kind of created, you've compartmentalized to where you're 
backbone companies can concentrate and innovate there and then you can have uh, the people delivering you know to customers that are innovating on that end and focusing solely on speeding up that piece and providing the best product they can provide um and a whole bunch of competition can happen prices can go down you know companies will start up and die some will succeed but you'd have a competitive market yeah it's a free market solution uh, but you gotta, you know, use a cliche, break some eggs if you want to make a cake. Yeah, I mean, again, one would hope that the uh, these large monopolies we're talking about, you know, really, let's just call them who they are, you know, Comcast and Verizon, right? Like, there's AT and T, really? Sure, yeah, AT and T uh, as well, right? Charter, like those are the big four. But one would hope they would see the writing on the wall that eventually this is going to happen, converting a portion of their business model to a utility is not such a bad play, especially with like a growing trend for people who just want internet access. You could build that right into that utility Mm -hmm. and you would probably gobble up market share doing that. Yeah. And if you separate these industries, then you're going to have excellence in content you're gonna have excellence in providing internet to your home and you're gonna have kind of you know centers of excellence on the backside like because they're all going to be able to focus and provide like the best product they can to their consumers not to mention um you know if you separate out the content delivery as well yeah. which they should um then you have Real competition in real industries because there's no um there's no like category bleed over to where people are kind of mm-hmm. leveraging because like while synergies are good uh, in business, uh, as we can see now, it kind of gets out of hand. Well, yeah, they they <laughs> you know the cost isn't isn't always worth it. Like the the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? Like a lot of times you end up with like companies going for consolidation for market synergies right right and just smushing these companies together to make larger you know entities a lot of times you get a ton of redundancy well there's that but then there's also i mean from a consumer standpoint you don't really i mean the the idea of you know a company controlling the uh pipeline and the content that is being delivered to you is very similar to the company that controls the phone backbone and the hardware that you Absolutely. need to use it. Yeah, we, We've been down this road before, and we realized it wasn't a great idea. And for a GPI to just start, you know, ushering in a new age of, you know... The old age. The old age. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem... Uh. <sighs> Come to the FCC, a new age of yesterday. Exactly. Um, there are better solutions for this. Um, and and that's really, I mean, kind of to you know, bring this home, that's what telecom and cable don't want you to realize, is that's what they're really afraid of. They're afraid of local loop unbundling. They're afraid of somebody saying, hey... That infrastructure of yours, we actually kind of need that um, to, you know, better our country. Well, and not just that. It's not just we need it. I mean, like, because that's a big, big, big deal. But it's also we've effectively paid for it, that, yeah. right? Like, we've been paying exceedingly high rates and, you know, subsidizing them through yes. and, prote- and sheltering them from other competition and, yeah. and which are all like, different forms of subsidies and it's it's not just the federal level it's happened at the local level the, yeah. i mean and not just state like municipalities towns have made sweetheart deals Absolutely. with these companies saying okay you know you can come in and because no one else otherwise it's a do or die situation um yeah. for 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 the town and this is a, a good example of this is seattle um Seattle had a, I think, a exclusivity deal with Comcast a while back, um, and it was to the point where um, it was going to expire. And Seattle tried to kind of play, you know, hard and say, "Well, we're not, 
you know, we'll, we'll just go somewhere else. The problem is Comcast built out the infrastructure. Comcast in owns the lines. They own right? the lines. The only way that Seattle can, like, another company can come in and offer Seattle, like, the, you know, services that Comcast did is for them to completely build a redundant network out. Right. Which isn't going to happen. So while back in the day when there were like 40 companies and there was almost kind of like a symbiosis between yeah. the local community and the company itself, because while there wasn't competition, still the company wouldn't have existed if the local town didn't want a service. So they kind of created like a you know a symbiotic relationship. But as those um, local providers were purchased into a bigger, you know, more a conglomerate, they could sit there and say, ah, well, you know what? We don't need your city. Right. You can just, they, they could push them. Because the city is kind of like, the city's not getting, you're not getting television service. Yeah, they it's don't have of, a strong hand. Right. That's not going to work. Where a, a big company can sit there and say, oh, you know what? We'll wait you out. You'll eventually come back. No one else is going to go and build out a service for you. It takes forever. This has been shown, like, how hard it is to compete. Google's not really able to do it on wireline. Google's put it into some cities, and they backed off. Right. It's just too expensive. And that yeah. is one of the biggest companies in the world. Well, and that is that is why the monopolist protection was put in for so long. Basically, the the point here is that the industry like the infrastructure itself has reached a level of maturity to where the areas that are serviced currently, you know, don't need monopolist protection anymore, right? The infrastructure is right. there. It's built. And the companies have recouped their capital from it. Yes. Right? And they did it a long time ago. Yeah. Because that infrastructure was laid out long ago. Right. For the most part. And now they all have, you know, sports stadiums named after them. Right. So once you and get to so, that, that should be the rule. Yeah. Once you, you have, have a sports, sports stadium, stadium named after you, yep. you know, maybe it's just time to kind of pack it up. Be careful, because <laughs> I've got to call into the Ravens to see if they want grounded reason to sponsor them. Oh, well. Uh, you know, you never know. Maybe like a wiffle ball stadium. <laughs> Are there is there a wiffle ball stadium? There I needs to be there. one. There should be. I need to talk to some like other like frisbee web... golf. Oh yeah, I need to talk to some like a oh, some other like uh, small web companies um, and see if we should get like a wiffle ball lead together where we can have like you know grounded reason field where <laughs> and I don't, I don't see that happen. E bombs world field or like <laughs> whatever. Oh, God. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, so, I mean, that's really kind of the lowdown on um, the real story behind why they're fighting Title II tooth and nail. Yeah. Because, you know, there's tons of people, you know, 23 million people who don't have access to broadband. Um, If you have somebody sitting there with a Title II designation down the road, it's going to be very easy for you know, what we just talked about, local loop unbundling to occur. They know that. That's why they're saying that, like, this is the second coming of Marx, um, essentially. Yeah. Well, it's not. I mean, it's... it's. You started with a monopoly. You started with government protection. Eh, it's kind of... Uh, now we're just talking about removing it. Right. That's really what it is. Well, I mean, or we're just... We're, we're talking about... Those companies making good on the social contract they were given. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that kind of brings this episode to a close. If you have questions or comments, comments, as Chris Hardwick would say, um, <laughs> you can email us at podcast at groundedreason.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Grounded Reason. Go to the Facebook page. Just search Grounded Reason. It'll come up. You can go to groundedreason.com. You know, leave a comment on the blog. Um, leave a review on iTunes for us if you're digging the show. Yeah, those uh, are my favorite. Yeah, love that. Uh, and subscribe. It's free. <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. All you have to do is hit the button. And it makes us happy. It does. It makes us smile. I'm Dennis Restaro. And this is Joel Reeves. 
and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.